Good morning and happy Sabbath, everyone. Welcome to Sabbath School, where this morning we will be studying planning for success. Um, and it definitely goes along with the theme that we've had this entire quarter. So very excited to jump into it. Uh, but before we get started, we will have a testimony by Sister Janet. So everyone, this has been very exciting for me because um, we had been on vacation for a bit. And when we came back, I'm going through the mail and all of a sudden I opened this envelope and there was a check inside. And I looked at it and I'm going, there must be some mistake. It came from um, the Kia dealership. And I thought, well, maybe they've mistaken me for my daughter because she also drives a Kia. And so I contacted her and she's like, nope, nope, nope. If you look on the year that they're saying it's applicable to, it's for your car. So I was like, oh, great, no problem. So I opened the next envelope and, um, it's a ticket for speeding. And I'm going, um, this has to be a mistake. And I look and unfortunately it's not. It was uh, my husband's truck. Uh, we realized that he had been driving in a zone for school and didn't realize the light had been flashing. So of course he was over and I would look at the amount and I went, yikes. But the reason why it's a testimony is because guess what? The check that I did not expect that was from the Kia Corporation was the exact amount to pay the parking <laughs> ticket. And yeah. I said, Lord, you have such a great sense of humor. I appreciate you and I thank you for that. So didn't have to lose my mind in regards to having a ticket <laughs> that was so unexpected because God knew exactly what was coming down the pike. And I personally think he allowed me to open that envelope before the ticket because I would have lost all of my peace from my vacation if I had done it the opposite way. So thank you, Lord, for blessing. I think it's interesting that you got them while you were on vacation so that they came together because I'm sure they didn't come the same day <laughs> in the mail. <laughs> well, praise God for that. Like, I love when things come together. I know we always talk about how the Bible, you can see the story from beginning to end, but Janet's vacation allowed her to see it from beginning to end. And we can hold on to that. Um, to know first, don't speed in school zones, guys. Like, <laughs> But if you happen to, without knowing, God will take care of you. <laughs> Amen. Amen. All right. And so I know we've had a lot of prayer requests. Um, throughout the time and there's a lot going on right now. So we'll open the floor for prayer requests and praise reports. I wanna praise God. Um, this week, there were two babies born, um, one at my son's school. Well, no, a parent of one of the children at my son's school. <laughs> it was not happening at my son's school. And then the other was, um, my cousin had her first child and it was at risk because she's 40. And so baby was born healthy and happy and beautiful. So I praise God for that. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. I know there's a, oh, sorry, go ahead. I, I just know. wanted to also say a praise of, I've recently and kind of as I've been starting out being an art therapist, I pray all the time that God give me wisdom for my clients and how to help them and all of those things because he knows them much better than I do and he knows what they need more than <laughs> I do so I always pray like in the mornings and this week I've just really seen that um, him working through me and also answering that prayer of giving me wisdom with each of my clients. And that's a praise. <laughs> Amen. And while we were talking about babies, there's a prayer request that one of our members had for her sister. Yes, it was her sister because they were excited about being aunts and uncles. Um, she's pregnant with twins and mm -hmm. she's also high risk. So if we could pray for, I don't remember her name is um, but we could pray for this member's sister and her pregnancy that she makes it to term with the babies and the babies are healthy. Mm -hmm. There's two baby girls. Oh. 
Um, I just want to praise the Lord that um, he is helping me to um, organize my time and uh, be productive. And so um, today I felt like um, I just saw God's hand and, and organizing when I did and everything went so well. And um, so I just am grateful to God for um, how he organizes time. Amen. <laughs> And I'd like to ask for prayer for a ministry at our church that we are undertaking or contemplating because it is it has the potential to have significant impact across various ministries in the church, but then for long term. So um, praying about that, that has been a personal um, area that I've been praying on, but I'd like to ask corporate prayer in regards to that also. And I just have a praise for peace in the middle of storms. Um, I think that's, this week has been a reminder in so many different ways that God won't save us from the storm. Sometimes he just shows up in the middle of it. Mm -hmm. And we, he wants us to go through it because there's glory on the other side. There's honor to his name, but he also allows us to keep our sanity um, as we're going through it and to know that not only will he be glorified, but we will be also built up um, to be closer to him mm -hmm. when we get to the other side of it. So praise God for peace. Yes. Yeah. All right. Do we have any other prayer requests or praise reports? If not, we will ask Sister Naomi to, um, to pray for our prayer requests and to open our Sabbath school. Um, okay. Please bow your heads. Um, dear Jesus, thank you so much for this day. Thank you so much for this time that um, we can all come to study together. And I am praying over the lesson. I'm praying over um, everything that we discuss. Please give us wisdom and please guide us through this study. And um, everyone who is listening as well, please bless them. And I pray all of this that your will be done in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. And thank you very much. And let's hop right into our lesson. So the name of this lesson is planning for success. And the big question that we're going to ask at the beginning and at the end is what does success look like? What does it mean to be successful and to be happy? So let's answer that first before we get started without bringing the lesson too much into it before you studied this. What did you think it meant to be successful and happy? Having obtained your goals. Mm -hmm. It all depends on your perspective. Because for me, when I first thought of it, I was like success. Hmm. Um, being able to accomplish something. Yeah, I think... Um reaching your goals um, and definitely happy um, would be a sense of peace and uh, well-being, healthy. Obtaining your goals, accomplishing something, being at peace and being ha happy, happy and healthy. Um, Naomi, what does it mean? What does success mean to you before you studied this lesson? What does it mean to be happy? You're muted, by the way. It's changed over the years, but at this point, I'd say having my needs met. Mm -hmm. um, that's what I would say. Kind of feeling happy um, would be, and success as well, but um, I agree with everyone. Like my first thoughts were having my goals met and um, accomplishing that, feeling productive. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So, yeah. Winning. Winning, yeah. <laughs> and I would think having what you need plus a little, um, being feeling fulfilled, I think was also would be something I would throw in there. And so when you think of successful lives, whether you're looking at, actually let's do both in the Bible and in the, in the world in general, 
who would you consider had have, have, has had or does have a successful life? So let's go both. We're going to do one biblical, one biblical and one just general. So we'd have to pick someone probably that's at least lived most of their lives, right? Possibly. That's, I mean, because the definition of success, as we stated, was, you know, they're, they're, they've accomplished something, they've reached their goals. There's some young people who have reached their goals these days. I don't know if I can share, um, with it being Black History Month, I saw a documentary on the life of Rosa Parks. Mm -hmm. And um, one thing that people may not have known about her is that she'd been working with the NAACP. And so when they were looking for an opportunity to showcase the injustices, she was excited to have stepped into that arena. She was not the first person that they picked, that they wanted to be their case study, but she ended up being that person. So she talked about the fact that being able to be that person made her feel like she'd accomplished something. So for me, I would say Rosa Parks. And who's your biblical person? Oh, I love David. He David. is one of my favorite characters or people in the Bible. Reason being is with the military background, that man can plan. He was a strategist and he accomplished much. So David. So I have Rosa Parks. Go ahead, Lindsay. I think I'd have to say for my biblical person, uh, Joseph, mm -hmm. you know, because he he rose from a situation that would have appeared that his life was over. You know, he was sold as a slave and then um, the Lord blessed him and he worked to the very top, you know. Um, and then for. um a person. I mean, there's a lot of, there's been a lot of successful people, people, um, that my husband had me watching this documentary about Ulysses Grant. So I feel like that has to come to mind, you know, a similar story of being at the bottom, failing at a lot of things. And then, um, you know, winning the war basically for the North. All right, who's next? Well, Lindsay actually took my biblical first. So um, Joseph for years has been, just because of the triumph in the end in his heart toward his brother, um, him making it through the trials and then still maintaining um, or even greater in a greater degree developing his godly character. Um, so Joseph biblically, um, I guess my natural person, uh, man, I don't know. I have to come back to that one. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking um, Sister White, but the reason I didn't say her is because she probably wouldn't like that. So <laughs> she was so she was so humble and um, understated, and so I wouldn't want to say that because I think she probably like, oh, don't say me. So, <laughs> but just. Um, in the capacity of being able to be used by the Lord and still um, care for her family, be a wife. Uh, yeah, so it's, um, that's what I was thinking. Just um, some of the things that I often feel like, you know, it's a lot to juggle, but um, she was in ministry and, you know, a mother, not only to her own children, but other people's children. And so, yeah. So I guess I did there. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and Naomi. And you muted again. <laughs> I'm sorry. I stepped away for a minute, so I didn't get to hear Janet's. Um, but I would say Esther would be a successful person in that she got to save her people um and she also was brave enough to stand up to save her people and I think that's very successful and um 
And as far as someone today or out of biblical times, um, I've been trying to think, but I mean, I could say Martin Luther King Jr. I would say he was really successful um, in his movement and everything he accomplished with what he did, so yeah. I think these were all great. Like I, so it's funny because the one, the number one I would have chosen would have been Joseph, um, just because I, the the trials from childhood all the way through it was like, yeah, fall down, come back up, fall down, come back up, fall down, come back up. Like there was so many things that his life went it wasn't a straight line. It was a bun a bunch of just moving all around. Um, and my success person in like regular life, it's very niche because I, I not looking at like the whole life. I saw a video of Steph Curry uh, probably like a week ago now. And he was on the other side of the court and he had a, a rack of basketballs and he was just throwing them up across the court. So like, so like you're on the opposite team's bench almost and he's throwing it full court and he made every single one of them. Wow. Every single one, it was like six of them in a row. And then he walks off. And so I was looking at that going, he perfected a part of the craft that you could tell it took time and perseverance and like dedication to have to, to work on that one thing, to perfect that one thing and become good at it. So that really impressed me that he could do that. Cause I mean, lots of people play basketball, but to be consistent mm-hmm. is a, there is another I have a hard time being consistent making dinner every night. So um, <laughs> that consistency of thinking those six shots in the row is really impressed me. So now that we have our definition of success, before we get started, let's jump into it. Uh, the, the lesson did talk about Joseph uh, when, as far as successful, and it talked about John the Baptist being successful um, in this first part of the lesson. But we're going to look at what should it mean what should success really mean when we look at it in a b- biblical way and as Christians? So let's start off with Ecclesiastes 12 1. I can read that. Okay, thank you. Remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth, while the evil days come not, nor the years draw nigh, when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. All right, so this verse is the polar opposite of YOLO. You only live once. And it's saying to remember the creator in the days of our youth. So why is this so important? Why do you think the Bible pointed this out? Especially when you look at how we live now, and I'm sure that this is not any, there's nothing new under the sun. So why do you think this this verse is so important? I think... Because this is coming from, by the world's view, a very successful man. You know, he was the king and he had all the wisdom, the money, the women. I mean, he had all this. And at the end of his life, he says, this this is his counsel. His counsel is to remember God early because Mm -hmm. even in the midst of his wisdom he got caught up with a lot of different things and so coming from him I think that it stands out even more to remember God in your youth and then too um when you're young there's a simplicity that um as you get older and things get more challenging um you if you have a foundation in the Lord starting out it'll help kind of root you and ground you before you um, get pulled off. Like Lindsay was saying, some of the things that, you know, Solomon was pulled off into. I was going to say a similar um, line of, if we have this as our foundation, it will be, when things get hard, when things get stressful, when things get difficult, we go back to habits. We go back to Mm -hmm. easy things to do we go back to the things that just come 
we don't have to work really hard for it because this is really hard right now. And so having that relationship with God and remembering God at the foundation, that will be what's easy to go back to. And that's what will sustain us through the hardship and through, like he said, the days where we have no pleasure in them. And I think it's also good for us to remember that when we're young and when we're in our youth, we're, we're pretty inexperienced and we're immature in, in a lot of ways. And if we don't have something to guide us during that immaturity, we tend to fall into some, some traps that we don't even know we're walking into. Um, so I think it's also a protection for us mm-hmm. so that, you know, as we mature, because we, I, as we're all, every year older we get, we look back on things we did last year and go, I can't believe I did that. Mm-hmm. I can't believe I made that mistake. Um, and so now I look back on my twenties and so I'm like, why did I, why did I do that? And we try to teach our children better. And we try to teach, mentor other people to do better than we did because we have wisdom now. Um, but I think this really gives a found, sets the foundation of if we are with God early, like you said, Naomi too, it gives those, it gives us those good habits. Mm-hmm. So let's look at someone who knew that timing, he didn't really know timing was everything, but he kind of did things in the right order ish. Um, let's read Genesis 29 verses nine through 20. Yes, this is. 29, 9 through 20. 29, 9 through 20. Okay. Um, now, while he was still speaking with them, Rachel came with her father's sheep, for she was a shepherdess. And it came to pass when Jacob saw Rachel, the daughter of Laban, his mother's brother, and the sheep of Laban, his mother's brother, that Jacob went near and rolled the stone from the well's mouth and watered the flock of Laban, his mother's brother. Then Jacob kissed Rachel and lifted up his voice and wept. And Jacob told Rachel that he was her father's relative and that he was Rebekah's son. So she ran and told her father. Then it came to pass when Laban heard the report about Jacob, his sister's son, that he ran to meet him and embraced him and kissed him and brought him to his house. So he told Laban all these things. And Laban said to him, surely you are my bone and my flesh. And he stayed with him for a month. Then Laban said to Jacob, because you are my relative, should you therefore serve me for nothing? Tell me, what should your wages be? Now Laban had two daughters, the name of the elder was Leah, and the name of the younger was Rachel. Leah's eyes were delicate, but Rachel was beautiful of form and appearance. Now Jacob loved Rachel, so he said, I will serve you seven years for Rachel, your daughter. And Laban said, it is better that I give her to you than that I should give her to another man. Stay with me. So Jacob served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed only a few days to him because of the love he had for her. All right. So in this, timing was everything. Um, And this pivotal moment in Jacob's life happening at uh, an interesting time in his life. What happened right before he met Rachel at the well? He was, he had deceived his brother Mm -hmm. um, and his father, more recently his father. And so he was escaping um, his brother's anger because he had stolen his birthright. And um, he had um, already had a dream where he had seen angels ascending and descending on a ladder between him and God, and he had realized that God had forgiven him. Um, And the Lord brought him there to his mother's family. 
-hmm. And why was this order of events so important? Why did it have to happen this way? I think it was important that Jacob realize that deception is, um, it doesn't, it doesn't end well, you know, it causes pain. He had to leave his family. Um, mm -hmm. And yet the Lord showed him that he wasn't forgotten and that the Lord was still working it out for him. And then, I mean, maybe they were the only ones out in the wilderness, but I tend to think there were probably a lot of other people he could have come across first. Right. The Lord brought him, you know, to this mm -hmm. well to find this particular daughter of his um, mother's brother. So, I mean, this was his first cousin. So he, he kisses her as, you know, welcoming, oh yeah, I'm your cousin. And also I'm in love with you. I mean, it's, <laughs> I mean, it's a different day and age, but. <laughs> well, and then also right after he'd had the experience with the latter, he made a vow to God that if God was going to be with him and for him, watching over him, he would take everything that he had and give it back to God um, in thanksgiving for what God had done for him. So he had, he was walking into this space, trusting that God had already set apart what needed to be done in his life. Mm -hmm. I think that that's very good to point out because when he got to Rachel, which is, I think it's interesting that I just noticed this this time. I think I've noticed it in the times prior, but he knew who Rachel was. Mm -hmm. he never met Rachel his mother mm -hmm. kind of told him you're going to my my brother my brother but he saw her at the well and was like oh you're my cousin it's like do you look like my mom like how do you <laughs> oh that was his cousin mm -hmm. um so I thought that was interesting in itself but I think Janet and Lindsay both pointed out good facts that you know he learned his lesson and he walked into this trusting so he had a firm foundation by the yeah. time he took on a wife and started so, a family. Crystal, just for clarification, it had been pointed out to him that Rachel was coming with her father's flock to the well. You're right. So, yeah. Yeah, absolutely right. It, they did say that. Um, but having that firm foundation, I think when we look at choosing a spouse or mm -hmm. you know, bringing someone else in our lives, especially when it comes to a spouse and children, a lot of times we think that that's gonna fix us. Mm -hmm. So having that that timing um, is is great and precise, and we saw that with with Jacob. Uh, so if someone can read Second uh, Corinthians six fourteen through fifteen. Second um, Corinthians six, I'll get yes. that. Fourteen through fifteen. Fifteen. Okay. Fourteen and fifteen. All right, and that is. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship have righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communication have light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part have he that believeth with an infidel? So why do you think that we're given this, this counsel, especially when we're talking about looking for a spouse? Um, well, the Bible says in Amos 3 and 3, how can two walk unless they be agreed? And that's with any relationship, not just the um, marital relationship, even business partnerships or um, undertaking a, you know, a project. If um, there's not an agreement or you're not in the same communion, um, you're setting a foundation that's already divided. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be difficult to build on that. Mm -hmm. And so we're looking at the first point of our success when we're building this, what does success look like? Having that firm foundation, mm -hmm. knowing what's first and before we step into things, being equally yoked with those who we are making a decision to commit to, whether it is like you just pointed out, business partnerships, uh, working on projects or, or a spouse or friends for that matter. Because we have to remember God in our youth and what the decisions we make in our youth are a lot of these decisions. 
So let's continue on as we look at the blessing of work. And I had to say the title of this because I think it's going to be great that how this comes up. So if someone can grab Genesis 2.15 for us, and then someone else, um, 2 Thessalonians 3, 8 through 10. So I have Genesis 2, verses 15. Would you like me to read that now? Yes, go ahead. Go for it. All right, so Genesis 2.15 from the New International Version says, The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and to take care of it. All right, and then 2 Thessalonians 3, verses 8, 8, 8, 8 10. 10. Yes. Nor did we eat anyone's bread without paying for it, but with labor and hardship we kept working night and day so that we would not be a burden to any of you, not because we do not have the right to this, but in order to offer ourselves as a model for you so that you will follow our example. For even when we were with you, we used to give you this order. If anyone is not willing to work, then he is not to eat either. Hmm. Okay, so look at Genesis first. Were, was this pre or post sin? Pre. 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 And we see that even in the most ideal, perfect environment, God told Adam, you have to work, sir. Mm. You have a job. You have a purpose. Um, he wasn't just sitting by the waters, taking it all in every day. Although a great vacation is, is lovely, but he had to work. Um, difference post sin is that he said by the sweat of his brow. So that's one thing to put out there. But then when we look in 2 Thessalonians, uh, today we, we a lot of people, are they don't want to work or they feel like, you know, I get to a point where I, I need a, a permanent break or long-term breaks. What does the Bible say about trying to get out of doing the, the hard things and, and working and kind of maintaining your, your keep? You don't work, you don't eat. <laughs> and I think, you know, people in varying degrees have different food preferences. But in my experience, everyone wants to eat something at some point. It'll get to them. Mm -hmm. And in looking at this, why do you think that the concept of work is a blessing? Especially when it comes to looking at success. Well, oh, I'm oh, sorry, go ahead. Um, I think you kind of pointed it out when we were talking about Adam and you said his purpose. Thinking of our purpose, thinking of the reason why we are here or the reason why we are at this place or what have you gives hope. That gives um, help in the time that it's really hard or what have you. So thinking about that, having that purpose um, in work can be really healthy and a good thing. And I was gonna say it's um, the feeling like Adam and um, the, the, they, it was, it, was, it was going to add, the work would add to the enjoyment of their life. Um, productivity, seeing um, the creativity, the beautiful garden that you have a part in dressing that. Um, the reward that comes from the work is what, mm -hmm. what God was giving, um, you know, to them because um, the hardness or the labor or the toil of it didn't come until after sin, but that, that need to feel productive um, is something that um, he was allowing them to exercise. Mm -hmm. I think um, it gave him the opportunity to appreciate um, what God gave them in the sense that you know like what you're saying I don't think you can have success without working you know there mm -hmm. might be someone whose parents you know leave them an inheritance of you know millions of dollars but you still wouldn't say they're successful they're just wealthy you know right. they mm -hmm. haven't done anything to obtain it and they probably don't enjoy it or appreciate it as if they had mm -hmm. and that's the question I have for you all what's the difference between a job and work is it the same 
sometimes. Janet is, is has an emphatic no right now. I want to hear from you, Janet. <laughs> oh, when you are doing something that you thoroughly enjoy and you don't have the pressures of meeting basic needs, mm -hmm. there's a freedom that comes with that. Mm. So in your early years of working, when we have the mortgages to pay, car um, payments, um, kids tuition, all that other stuff, we work to make sure those needs are taken care of. Mm -hmm. And prayerfully, we have planned and budgeted. So by the time the kids are gone, the house will be paid off and the car is paid off. The money that you make now would be to take care of your needs and well, first and foremost, what God has placed on your heart to take care of. So in that space of working, it's working with a different type of purpose. Mm -hmm. So that's what's my emphatic no. And I, I think that along those same lines, there's, we do jobs. There's things that we do to make money. Mm -hmm. And then there's a purpose, like kind of what Naomi was saying earlier, um, we're all created for a purpose. And that is our life's work. Yeah. Sometimes you hear about people's life's work. Actually, I didn't think about that before I said that word um, or that, that phrase, but the things that they were created to do that come so naturally and easily. And we kind of talked about this a few weeks back, uh, maybe over a month ago now, but the things that we mm -hmm. are just, the talents that are in us that we do just naturally mm -hmm. and it becomes the thing that we, are able to give and continuously give um, becomes the work that we see the fruits of versus the pay outside of a paycheck. Sometimes those two things align. And when it does, that's beautiful because you're able to actually get cash or tender, or can take care of your household yeah. with things that you enjoy doing. But a lot of us, it takes a little bit to get there um, to be able to, to align the two. Mm -hmm. Anyone else want to touch on the blessing of work? All right, I so want to say that um, the when you compare the job with work, um, I was going to say about that is um, work in itself can be enjoyable. A job necessarily has a different you know motivation behind it. You're trying to provide or so you, ideally you want it to be enjoyable, mm -hmm. but sometimes, a lot of times, that's not your motivation in doing it. Um, like gardening, for example, is a lot of work, but, yes. you know, it's so rewarding in itself. And you do have the payout of, the, you know, the produce, but um, it's, it, it's a different motivation. Whereas when you go to a job, it's um, something that you're doing to provide for your family and provide needs. Um, whereas, you know, not all work. Um, and so that, I think that the motivation uh, part is different with work and, and the job. Mm. And Janet brought up a good point about when you're in your early days of working in a job, you're taking care of family, you're doing certain things. And we're given about that 40 year-ish time where we are, that's like our earning years. Um, that we have things to do. So let's look at a couple of verses that kind of talk around that to see what are the expectations during that time of our lives. So let's look at Proverbs 14, 23, and then Colossians 3, 23 and 24. So whoever gets to Proverbs first, let's, let's do that one first. It was Proverbs what? 14, 23. I have it. Okay. It says, in all labor, there is profit, but mere talk leads only to poverty. Mm. All right, so that means that we actually have to do the work. We can't just say we're going to do it. Mm -hmm. um, and the was saying with the garden, you know, you, get, you can say you're going to plant the seeds all day long, but until you plant it, there will be no cucumbers. All right, and then second, I'm sorry, Colossians 3, 23 through 24.
Okay. I'll read that one. Okay. Colossians 3, 23 and 24. Yes. It says, and whatsoever ye do, do it heartily as to the Lord mm -hmm. and not unto men, knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the, inher of the inheritance for ye serve the Lord Christ. Mm -hmm. So in looking at this verse in Proverbs um, and then the verse in Colossians, what does that have to do with finances and just the overall well-being of our households? Well, I think about Colossians. Um, it, it really drives your, you know, it speaks again to that motivation, you know, not you don't want, you want to do it excellently because if you're doing something for the Lord, you want it to be you know excellent. And um, a lot of people, like even um, being a homemaker, people say, oh, you know, um, you don't get a lot of satisfaction or reward, or no one thanks you for that. But when you're doing it as unto the Lord, you know, what more thanks do you need? You're doing it for Him. And so, um, and not that our you know emotions always line up with that. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that um, if you align your focus. Um, and let that be the motivation for your work, then it, um, it does, it, it's a lot more rewarding and, and you would do it with a different um, mindset. It makes it possible to still be fulfilled while having a terrible boss, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, because you're not working for that person. Mm -hmm. You're working for God, you know? Yeah. Uh, so I think it can help you to move past other things that may be at work. And I think it allows us to find our work in our jobs. Mm -hmm. Based on the just definition we have of where that whole purpose and being fulfilled, you can find that in anything we do, but especially in our jobs where the motivation is different. So and when we take a job, you know, a lot of a lot of us don't have the the uh, the freedom that some of us have on to work in a Christian environment. Mm. We may be working with all types of people, or you know, going from job to job, you encounter different people that believe different things. So I think that's also very interesting to see. And we're going to talk a little bit about that um, that how people view when we work that way. But it, before we get there, it also talks about in those 40-ish years, there being some things that, you know, we are to work and have those earning years, but there's some other responsibilities that we have to tackle during this time. Sister Janet I started to allude to some of them, but what are some of these stresses of life that also come into play during the this time that we have to also do as if we're doing it for God? Raise children. Raising children, definitely. That's a big one that's there. Buying homes and paying them off. Mm -hmm. yeah. you um, think you education home of those children. Education Sorry. of those children, yes. I was going to say, um, most people may not think of it this way, but eating healthy, having a good sleep routine, getting physical like exercise in your day mm -hmm. all of those things um are hard to do when you don't have a focus that is on them or on them in relation to god and it's hard to do those when we get distracted and let work or let things get in the way of those things like eating healthy, sleeping well, drinking water like we should and all of those things. So I would add that to <laughs> building that foundation. And Naomi makes a good point, which then also made me think about in these years, even though it may not be, well, you know, it was probably normal back in biblical times and we probably need to put it back into place caring for elderly parents because while you are yeah. in this stage of your life your parents have aged and the responsibility based on what the bible teaches us is that we are to look out for our relatives and what better relative or closer relative than a parent who is aging so 
um, that comes in these years of living too. Mm -hmm. And I think in all of that, if we look at doing that with all of our might as if we're doing it for God, whether it's raising children, it's taking care of parents, it's um, taking care of our bodies and our health, educating our children, um, no matter what situation you're in. I think when we look at look at it as if it's our God-given talent to do that thing or our God-given gift to do that thing, the even the satisfaction that comes out of it is a little different. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so when you when you do you give it your all, and especially in environments where not everyone knows God or has that relationship with God, how do they view you a little and a little differently, possibly? Um, I actually had this happen to me at the job that I work at. Just after talking with one of my coworkers for a little while, they they were saying that you just have a light about you. Mm -hmm. You just have like a light that makes it feel like you've never, I mean, in their words, struggled with anything or gone through anything that was really hard or tough. And they just said that I had a light about me in that way. And I was like, <laughs> I had to laugh a little bit because I was like, I've been through so many things. And... <laughs> It was like, <laughs> um, and as I reflected that on that, it was, it was all God carrying me through, like, it was all God, and I had to say, like, it's not like I haven't been through anything, and their reply was, but you're not angry about it, mm -hmm. you're not still angry about it, that's not like on my shoulders or that's not what I'm carrying around mm -hmm. and um I just um in those times I felt like I didn't have a choice I felt like I didn't want to stay in those feelings I didn't want to continue in that so I made like I feel like I made that choice to look at the positive and keep my focus on God through those hard times. Um, and I, like I said, I have to give it to God helping me through. So. That's a testimony in itself. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. To see that. And we talked about Joseph earlier. That was one of the examples they use in the lesson for that. So in looking at his life and so what are some of the things that he did that would show that integrity and how did that play out for him? Well, the first um, integrity I thought was in his attitude and how he worked for Potiphar, mm -hmm. because he could have been bitter, angry, um, resentful in his demeanor, and um, just in the fact that he was elevated and that God was with him while he was there, the Bible says that God was with him, um, so shows that he had that right mindset to work in this unjust situation um, and do it as unto the Lord. And, you know, he was serving even in prison, mm -hmm. you know, he had worked his way to being, you know, some type of uh, leader within the prison. And then, I mean, he could have been bitter, you know, mm -hmm. I didn't deserve to be sold out here. I don't deserve to be thrown in prison. I'm just going to sulk here, but no, he was still using the gifts that God gave him to, without pay, to um, help to, to uh, share with the, the butcher and the baker, or the baker and the cupbearer. <laughs> um, and um, he didn't have to do that. It's not like, I mean, he did hope that the the mm -hmm. top bear would remember him but he didn't you know but he did that um he shared the gift that god had given him and another thing that i liked that i just realized as we were as i was contemplating the lesson is after mrs potiphar's action put him in prison and he became elevated 
he didn't go seeking revenge. Mm -mm. He never took revenge against anyone else when he moved into a higher role. Yeah. And then we saw that play out even more so when his brothers came to get grain. Mm -hmm. He treated everyone fair and with respect. And mm -hmm. I don't know about you guys, but I'm not <laughs> saying that if I was in a situation, I'd be seeking revenge. But I know that monster that jumps on you when people get in your business and then you become able to return the favor. Mm -hmm. He didn't let that monster climb up on his back in writing. Mm. I wanted to add to that that like when we're when we're looking at Mrs. Potiphar, a lot of people saw that. A lot of people saw that he was um, lied on and he, all of those things or what have you. However, most of if not every person around him at that time never knew what his brothers did to him. Mm -hmm. True. All the people around him, from what I'm what I'm remembering, the people around him didn't know that his brother sold him. Mm -hmm. And so when it came to the time <laughs> where his brothers came for food, no one would have known different. No one would have known different. No one would have said, that's your brothers. How could you? Mm -hmm. No one would have known different if he decided to not give them food or decided what have you in his power that he had. So, well, I think we talked about it in another Sabbath school lesson of doing the things for God, even if no one's watching, mm -hmm. even if no one's watching, which is kind of, the situation he was in no one really knew and could say anything about what he was doing if he chose to seek revenge on his brothers so for him to still give them forgiveness after all of that and lean on god is so powerful as well and so in looking at going through his entire life. And I think these were some amazing examples that came out of that, um, especially with the combining Naomi's testimony about the light and people saying that she doesn't look like she's been through anything. And then having Joseph, who was also an example of that. What are some things that we can take for our daily lives as examples when it comes to doing things for God, having that integrity, um, and then knowing that this is what will the result will be in the end? And the end could be the end of the day, by the way, not the end of time. Yeah. Now, when we put things in perspective as to why are we here, what is our why? Our why is to bring honor and glory to God, to be vessels used by him, to share and show others what it means to trust God. Mm -hmm. So when we walk in the why of our life, then we would be successful because we've accomplished what God has put in place for us. Mm. And so I, I like that when we walk in that, that why of our life, um, there's a certain level of trust that has to be put into that in order to do that, because we don't necessarily know the why of our life. Uh, we don't know why we were created, why, what God has for us. And we looked at the promise earlier in the lesson. Sometimes we're given the, the covenant, but, and, but we don't know how to get from the covenant to the promise um, being fulfilled. So a lot of this is walking blindly. So let's look at Proverbs 3, 5 through 8, and let's see what kind of counsel we get when it comes to that. Uh, oh, go ahead. <laughs> um, Proverbs 3, 5 through 8. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. Mm -hmm. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. 
It will be health to your flesh and strength to your bones. Amen. So while we're looking for our why, our purpose, our life's work, how should we be walking? Like what, how should we be operating and living? In total trust and uh, faith in God. Mm -hmm. That he will be making your... uh, work worthwhile that he will be blessing um what you do it connects to the um praise that i had earlier um of how i pray for god to show me wisdom with Mm -hmm. my clients this verse is saying do not be wise in your own eyes Mm -hmm. and trust in god so asking God for wisdom in situations where we don't know or we haven't really heard of a way to go about it yet um, or anything like that. So that's how we can walk is always seeking God's wisdom. And this would be one of my questions. I'm glad you pointed that out is how do we trust God? How does that look? What does that look like? Mm-hmm. Um, because in big situations, it's easy to say, I can't figure this out. Mm-hmm. I'll pray. But mm-hmm. in that, even in that situation, the first part of it is I can't figure this out. So what does that full trust of God mm-hmm. actually look like when it comes to, to being successful, walking in integrity, um, being that light for others to see? I think the other part of that verse where it says, leaning not to your own understanding, but in all your ways, acknowledging him and he shall direct your path. I think that, um, and sometimes it is just as simple as, you know, you try it and um, the, and believe that God, you know, will work out. You might only have that next step. You know, you might not have the full path that you're going to take, but just the next step. Mm-hmm. And so um, trusting enough to take that next step, you know, and then knowing that, when it's time, hopefully, then the next step. I mean, I think. Go ahead, Naomi. I was going to also ask, um, as the title of Thursday says, seeking godly counsel, actually seeking out those who have been before you or those who have, um, are well, been before you in the situation itself, but also who may be older than you um, and have been through a lot of things that have wisdom in themselves that they have also sought God's wisdom and they have studied God's word and those trusted people that seeking godly counsel is a way that we can walk um, in that way. And I, you asked what it look, what looks like. I think also with peace, you know, like mm. sometimes it's hard to know the right choice and you might be wondering, well, am I doing this right? Am I doing this wrong? But, you know, the servant, they don't have to call the shots. The servant just needs to do what the master tells them to do. They don't have to worry about the outcome. And I think when we are following um, and we're really submitted to God that we're not going to be worried about what the next step is going to be. We're not worried about how it's going to turn out. We're just trusting that the Lord will deal with the results mm-hmm. and we can follow the path that, and the work that he's given us right now. And I think I have small children and it's, you ever watch a child and they have limitless energy (laughs) and the reason is my husband's convinced of of this that it's because they don't waste any energy what's happening tomorrow or even what's happening today or an hour from now they're just focused on right now they don't have any idea about the next things it's just right now and i think we waste some a lot of energy sometimes on worrying Mm -hmm. about what's happening next Mm -hmm. instead of trusting that the Lord will give us what we need when the time comes. 
That's a good point. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I know we read a devotion this week that talked about, um, I gave an analogy of a tree and the tree being watered with the living water of Christ. And when you think of it that way, because that water never runs out, you're not preserving for yeah. tomorrow. Um, and there's also a verse that says, uh, don't, do not worry about what you eat or what you will drink. Don't, don't worry about tomorrow because tomorrow has its words of its own. Mm-hmm. You need to be in today. Um, so I think that that is very, very true, Lindsay, um, that children don't think about tomorrow. They don't think about if I'm, and we do this as adults, we overthink way too much. I mean, <laughs> Mm-hmm. If you think about it, some of us are tired about next week. And we're saying, I'm not going to do this thing after church on Sabbath because next Wednesday, I got a long day and I need to, to store up my energy because I'm going to be tired on Wednesday. So I'm just going to rest today. <laughs> and we, we all do it. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think it, that's one of the things that it, it's, as adults, it, it's a learned behavior. Mm-hmm. We hear other adults adulting and do that and say that. Um, mm-hmm. But if we truly lean on God with all of our heart and all, and on his understanding, he is the provider of energy. Yeah. So if he wants us to do something, we're going to find, he's going to find a way to give us that time. And like you were saying earlier, uh, Sister Lavana, about the time being a, that God like ordered your time so that you're able to get the things done that you need to get done. When we're walking in his will, you'll find that five minutes is a long time. Yeah. Mm. Where we're five minutes can go by quick and you're like, oh, I'm I gotta get this done, this done, this done. But we didn't stop and ask first, God, what is it that you want me to do? Mm -hmm. Um, That was the point I was gonna make earlier too, is a lot of times we try it first and then go to God instead of going to God first. So he has to fix it instead of us doing it his way the first time. So I think that gets us all in a mess every yeah. single time. <laughs> yeah. So as we wrap up this lesson, we've talked about success in a different light. We've talked about it, putting things in priority, first things first. We talked about uh, working in integrity um, so that others can see that light. We talked about the time that we're supposed to work and working in a blessing and what work looks like, what really is work. Um, having a purpose and working in that purpose. And then we talked about seeking godly counsel. So uh, leaning on God for everything that we do, that wisdom. We talked about Solomon in the beginning and Solomon, that's what he asked for was that wisdom. And even he said, when you're young, follow God first. Mm -hmm. And yeah, young youth is a relative term. Um, (laughs) So now that we've studied this lesson, what does success look like to you? What does it mean to be successful? Mm. To be in Christ. Hmm. Focusing on God. To be doing what God um, has for you to do each day um, without worry um, about tomorrow. Mm-hmm. All right, Sister Janet, you want to throw one in there? As I was thinking about this, it's like the lesson told us that work is not about having just our income and being able to make money. Mm-hmm. Work is about operating in the abilities and functionality that God has given to us mm-hmm. so that we can accomplish whatever the task is. Naomi talked to us in the beginning about praying through our day before we get started. So when we think of work from the perspective of it being a calling from God, each day should then be new and different because we've given it over to him and then he has directed our steps. So we've sought him for godly counsel. We sought him for the direction that we're supposed to go. And then we execute it and the resources that we get from it, we turn it back to him so that we can start all over again. Mm-hmm. I am in full agreement with that. I was going to actually say to me, success now looks like finishing the job that God gave us for that time. Amen. Mm-hmm. So with that, we will wrap up this lesson on success. I hope you all got something out of that. If, and if you want to 
drop in the, the comments what does success look like to you that we would love to to hear some other viewpoints on this um as we are going to continue talking about different things i'm sure that this is just building the foundation for our next lesson so we will ask sister Lindsay to close us in prayer as we wrap up this lesson all right let's pray Dear Lord in heaven, we want to thank you so much for this lesson and this time that we have had to study it. Lord, we thank you for each person that is listening um, to this in various places, Lord. And we want to thank you that you love us so much that you actually not only created us, but that you ordained a work for us to do. Mm -hmm. Lord, we ask that you equip us and that you give us the faith and the peace to stay the course lord and um lord help us to just trust that you will take care of the details and lord help us to move forward in faith be with those that may be listening that are unsure of the direction that you have for them but lord we just ask that you um, lead and direct. And Lord, we thank you in advance for victory um, in our lives and for success. And we thank you in your holy name. Amen. 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 Thank you so much for that prayer. And thank you all for joining us. Make sure you come back next week as we will be studying the wear of covetousness. So thou shalt not covet, let's figure out what that means uh, as we study next week's lesson. So we hope you enjoyed the lesson and have a wonderful Sabbath. Happy Sabbath, everyone. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. See you next week. Bye.